So I'm going to give this a few minutes for everybody to get into. So I'm going to take like a couple minutes to get everybody in here, all the attendees. Good morning, everyone. Seeing some familiar names. We even have a caller. One phone call, one call in listener. Congratulations, caller number seven. <laughs> Let's see. Looks like everybody is in, so we'll go ahead and we will get started. Uh, good morning and welcome to our webinar, 3D Printing to the Max, using Asiga's multi-range and multi-stack features. Uh, we're going to be joined by Corey Lambertson today. Uh, my name is Bryce Hiller. I am the uh, Digital Marketing Specialist here at Whitmix, and I'm going to be facilitating today's webinar. Uh, before we dive in with Corey, um, I want to go over just a couple points. Um, first, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a questions box. Uh, feel free to type any questions you might have. Uh, in that space, and um, Corey will be answering them probably at the end of the webinar, possibly uh, I, might, I might pop in from time to time and ask uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, next, if you're a CDT, this webinar is approved for one hour of CE credit towards your certification. You will get an email uh, within one to two days that's going to give you instructions on how to get your uh, CE credit. Uh, and finally, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available within 48 hours on our website at Wimix.com. It will also be available on our Facebook page because we are also streaming live to Facebook, uh, and it will eventually be on our YouTube channel as well. So any of those three locations, you'll be able to access this webinar um, at your convenience at a later date. Uh, at this point, it is my uh, distinct pleasure to uh, introduce uh, a friend and peer, uh, Corey Lambertson. Uh, Corey has over eight years of experience in additive manufacturing. He started his career in the dental laboratory industry after college by joining his father at Heartland Dental Lab in 2013. From there, Corey ventured off into corporate dentistry by leading the technical support and training teams at Whitmix Corporation. While at Whitmix, uh, he found a passion for the Asiga brand of 3D printers and the revolutionary changes that they bring to the industry. Today, Corey is the general manager of Americas at Asiga and is based out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, that's all I've got. So uh, again, it is, my, it is my pleasure to introduce Corey Lambertson. Thank you, Bryce. I really appreciate the, the intro there. Uh, and thank you to all the attendees that are actually listening in today. We really appreciate your support. Hopefully we have quite a few Asiga users and hopefully we have some soon to be Asiga users uh, being able to take in this knowledge that I'm gonna to present today. So today's webinar, uh, it's actually a, uh, let me go ahead and share the screen first and foremost. All right, there we go. And so today's webinar, the, the title of it is 3D printing to the max using Asiga's multi-range and multi-stacking features. And so uh, I was uh, approached by Whitmix a few months ago on, on speaking for, uh, speaking on Asiga for them and I was kind of struggling with what did, what did I want to talk about? I mean, I can talk about the printers all day long and I can talk about what's so special about the hardware, but I really wanted to focus on something a little bit different. And I wanted to focus on the software side of it. And uh, there's some really cool features that really unlock the potential of your Sika printer. It doesn't matter if you have a Max, a Pro 4K, an old Pico 2, Pro 2, or even a Pico. Uh, these features can be used across the board. Um, so the, what we're going to look at is the multi-range and the multi-stacking uh, capabilities. Now, before we go into it, I do want to just give a little bit of a history lesson about Asiga and, and talk about some of our product innovations throughout the years. There we go. So we actually formed in 2007. So a lot of companies or a lot of people don't know that we actually, uh, we actually formed in 2007. So we're a 15 year old company and we're one of the first 3D printer companies uh, to actually emerge in the 3D printing area and dental arena. And so in 2011, we actually launched our first printer. And our ultimate goal was to design and build reliable and affordable 3D printers for manufacturing of end use products. And so, you know, just in that, in that line alone, it just says 3D printers, but what people don't realize is that we also manufacture 
and create and code our own software. And so when we actually formed in 2007, in those first couple of years, we actually hired two brilliant uh, interns, so software developers, and they actually are who still create and manage our software for Asiga and our firmware that runs our printers. And because of uh, you know, how intelligent these two gentlemen are, and they, they lead the team of engineers, they're able to come up with some crazy cool innovations like multi-stacking and multi-range capabilities. So throughout the career of Asiga, in 2007 we started, in 2008, uh, that's actually where the software began. And so that's where we hired our software engineers, our interns. And then in 2010 and forward in 2011, we actually created our very first printer called the Pico. And so the Pico was a revolutionary printer because we were the first printer to use a LED driven DLP projector. And we we're the first 3D printer to use Teflon film to print against. And we were revolutionary because we were only $6,990 at that point in time. In 2011, that was rare to see a printer at that price point. Our closest competitor was like $50,000. And what was unique about that is that, uh, you know, anybody could obtain this technology and begin a digital manufacturing uh, uh, powerhouse in their own facility. So throughout the years, our products have developed and our uh, equipment evolved until we got to 2017, and that was where we really had a major breakthrough with our Sega Max, and then in 2019 with our Pro 4K. And from 2017 forward, we adopted a technology uh, called the Smart Positioning System, which allows us to monitor layer thicknesses on the fly, and that actually aids into our capabilities of being able to create multi-ranges for our printing, which we're gonna cover here in a few minutes. So we had 12 years of product engineering and 12 years of product development and everything evolved all the way through. So throughout our career, we always looked at our hardware and how we could increase output. And specifically in increasing output for a dental laboratory, dental clinic, how do we actually you know, keep changing? How do we keep evolving with the existing hardware we have? And so before we actually go into that answer or for that question, I want to take a look at the workflow. And so when we look at a workflow for, for any digital uh, application in dental, it always starts at the patient. And so the patient's going to move to an intraoral scan or a, uh, or a traditional impression to move on to the lab scanner. All of it will land at a CAD design station or CAD software at some point. And then it will always end at the 3D printer. So what happens though, if your input end, your intraoral scanner end or your impression uh, end starts to increase in input. So let's say if you're actually receiving more intraoral scans or more traditional impressions that you wanted to convert into models or you need to print more surgical guides or more splints, how can you harness your existing hardware to increase output. And so that's what I'm gonna really highlight today with multi-stacking and multi-range. And so the answer is simple. Either you have to find a way to do it in a software side, or you have to increase your hardware. And so you may be at a point already where you are already using these features of multi-stacking or multi-range, and you're running out of capacity from the hardware side, and you may need to increase the hardware. Uh, the other aspect, is that if you're not, let's say if you feel like you're already at that, that tipping point of maximizing your output, but you're not using multi-range or you're not using the multi-stacking feature, it may be a good time to look at that to see if you can increase the output without increasing the hardware. We'd all love to sell another printer, but it may not be necessary for what you're trying to achieve. And so let's take a look at those two features. Now, just for everybody that has a Sega Composer, everybody knows, that it's, it's a completely free software, there's no updates, and it does come uh, with lifetime technical supports and it's unlimited downloads. You can download this on as many computers or, or stations that you like, and there's no limitation to it. And so throughout the life of Composer, just like our hardware had multiple changes throughout it, so did our software. And so our software, when it first started, it was just a simple nesting and slicing software. Uh, where it would take in your digital design and it would you would nest it and then it would create slices and it would send it to the printer. Pretty basic software when it first started, but throughout 
the, the life of the software, we came up with what was called multi-stacking. And so the multi-stacking feature capability gives the ability or gives users the ability to create multiple layers, multiple new builds on top of the next and export it out in a single run. And so I could print all of these models all in one run and I don't have to go back to the printer and manipulate it again. And so uh, this feature is really great for all indications. There's no limitations for what you're wanting to use it for. You could print a, you could print models with multi-stacking. Multi you could do surgical guides. You could do splints. You could do, uh, you know, really uh, dentures. You could do denture teeth. There's really no limitation there. And so if you're already maximizing your capacity, this is a great way that you could actually take that step further. What about at night? When you're not at the laboratory, how can you make your printer work for you? How many users here today on the webinar? Now, you, you can't raise your hand because I won't be able to see it. But if you were to raise your hand or, you know, you can uh, put in the comments, how many users here are actually printing just a single build at night, a single layer and not utilizing the multi-stacking feature? So there's a, uh, you have the ability to make your printer work overnight. And uh, when we look at hardware itself, the most expensive piece of hardware you have in your laboratory or dental clinic is the piece of hardware you're not using. The second most expensive is the piece of hardware that you're not using at full capacity. So let's make sure we get to full capacity. I'm gonna show a hands-on demonstration on how to utilize the multi-stacking and give some tips on how to do it effectively here in a moment. The next feature that we came up with was a SIGA multi-range. And so the multi-range gives you the freedom to print any object in any combination of layer thicknesses or unique set of parameters. And so this is kind of like thinking you have the ability to create adaptive layer thicknesses and it allows you to increase speed while maintaining accuracy. And so if we look at the image that's on the screen here, we can see we have two domes. And on these two domes, uh, we can see that the object on the left, let's say if that was printed in 150 micron layers, it's going to print significantly quicker than the object on the right. And let's say that was 50 micron layers. Those two objects, we can see, object on the left is going to print significantly faster. However, it's going to lose surface detail. And what if we needed surface detail on the upper half of the structure. We need to obtain that uh, accuracy and precision on that upper half or that, that smoother surface on the upper half. Well, that's where a SIGA multi-range comes into play. If you look at the image to the right, the furthest right, so this third one here, we can see we combined two dynamic layer thicknesses all in one print. And we can easily do that inside of the SIGA Composer software. And I'm gonna show you how. When we relate this to models, for example, or other indications, we can see that we can print a model in 150 micron layers. It's going to be extremely fast. However, you're going to lose some surface quality. We can see that we have like that topographical map look on our models. And that may not be desirable because we need that dentition or that occlusal surface to have the smoothest surface or the most precise surface possible when creating a structure. So, what we can do is we can apply a multi-range where we can speed up the printer for the first, let's say 10 millimeters or 15 millimeters. And then the last five millimeters or so, we can simply go ahead and actually have a very smooth surface. And we're able to reduce the print time significantly, which will allow you to get more prints, uh, prints cycled throughout a day. With that though, there is the caveat that when you use a SIGA multi-range, you'll have some layer surface quality down at the base where you'll see the actual layers. Uh, and you will see a transition line from when it went from, let's say 150 microns to 50 microns. You're gonna see that line and that's gonna be apparent. But you have to remember there's that trade-off that you're getting a more productive print throughout the, the, throughout the day. Something else that you will, will wanna be mindful is that when you're looking at different indications and printing this with, um, you need to make sure that you're doing it for a suitable application. We'll cover that here in a moment. Now, to be able to harness this section of the Composer software, it's all in the advanced parameters. And so under the advanced parameters, you have the ability to insert a range, and you'll be able to control the layer thicknesses or the distances that we want to have 
uh, controllable or uh, altered layer thicknesses in, and then be able to put fine layer thicknesses or reduce layer thickness for that uh, uh, increased detail. And we'll be able to see that live here in a minute. So when we look at applications uh, for using the Asiga multi-range feature, it's really, you know, where you're gonna see the most bang for your buck or the most capability is on the dental model side. And so when you're printing dental models, every dental model itself has a particular height to it where there's essentially no value. And so if we're looking at the, I guess, the gingival area of a model itself, there's no value of, of retaining any sort of surface quality there. And it's all about printing the dentition in a very smooth surface quality. And so what we can actually achieve uh, is printing dental models, whether it's fixed or removable prosthetics. Uh, you can easily print those models and effectively use multi-range. Just a little tip, if you are doing a, like a Geller style model with a removable die, if you do play with multi-range, it may affect how that removable die fits. And so there may be some adjustments that uh, would be necessary inside of your CAD software, whether you're using 3Shape, ExoCAD, or Dental Wings, uh, to make sure that you alter that fitment of that removable die. Uh, what about those pesky implant models that are super tall? And so a, a common complaint we'll get is, or not a complaint, but a uh, I don't, I guess it's more of a concern is that when you're designing inside, let's say, 3Shape or ExoCAD, uh, Dental Wings, whatever CAD software you're using, some of those implant systems, they have an extremely tall analog uh, shaft for the analog for that implant model. And so how can you actually increase the speed of that print, but still maintain the accuracy you need for that application? And so multi-range is that answer. Uh, also, what about objects that may that aren't models like splints or dentures or surgical guides, etc. Those models or those applications can still apply and use a SIGA multi-range to it, uh, but you'd be looking at applying it for the very first support structures. And so as you're building up supports, that would be the area that you'd want to apply multi-range to speed up the print uh, before you actually get to the actual application. Uh, so I'll actually show a demonstration of that as well. So how do we take it to the next level? And so what if we combined multi-stacking and multi-range on the same build? Well, you can, you can harness that. And so let's say if you wanted to have a multi-stack, but still wanted to have that multi-range feature being able to control the dynamic layer thicknesses throughout the build, you can tune that. What about multi-material? And so if anybody was here that was in Chicago, uh, Min Tran did a presentation for us and they did a presentation for Keystone where he spoke about multi-material printing. And so here's an image that Min Tran shared with me for this presentation. These are all builds that he did, not builds that I did. And uh, this is just different applications where you can do multi-material printing utilizing the multi-range feature. That application uh, would be a separate webinar itself, but just to get the ball, you know, the idea rolling, there are different applications that we can take a step further from multi-range to unlock different applications with your Asiga. So let's go ahead and do a hands-on demonstration. And so let me go ahead and close out of the screen. Uh, Bryce, do you want to check to see if there's any questions thus far? Yeah, let's take a look here. Um... Not a question, someone had a comment, said yes, one layer. I'm not sure. Brian, uh, Brian, if you could specify, if you have a question, uh, we'd be happy to answer it. But other than that, nope, uh, carry on, good sir. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. So when we're looking at setting up, we're going to start with a multi-stack. And so we're going to do a build that is multiple layers and essentially multiple build platforms within one encapsulated build. And so to do that, you're going to create a new build just like you normally would. And so I'm going to create a new build. I'm going to go ahead and find, I'm going to use a virtual printer for the Pro 4K just to show the capability. And then you'll choose the material you want to print with. And so let's see, I should have, let's see here, Bear Model OS Ivory from Whitmix. You can use this with any material though. I'm just selecting Whitmix for Whitmix's model material for this demonstration. And then you'll want to choose the layer thickness that you want to print in. 
And so for most fixed prosthetic applications, you're going to print in 50 micron layers. And for removal prosthetic, you would want to print in 100 micron layers, for example. I'm going to choose 50 microns. So from here, we'll want to go ahead and import in our, our models itself. So I have a series of models that I'll import in. Now, these are just all samples that I have. And I think I have one more model left. Here we go. And so I can see I still have quite a bit of space left. And so let's go ahead and maybe horseshoe some of these models together just so I'm using the full build envelope. And for any users that are new to the Asiga Composer software to move a structure, you simply left click on it to rotate a structure. You will simply right click and hold and move your mouse and it will simply rotate it. And let me go ahead and lock these two in between. All right, and just to make sure we take up as much space as we can, let me go ahead and clone this. Oops, grab the wrong two. There we go. All right, and so we can see we're utilizing majority of the build envelope. Uh, we have a total of seven full arch models on there. I could easily, if I want to spend a little bit more time playing Tetris with the software, I could actually go ahead and place a few more models on there. Let's say if I had some quadrants, then I'd be able to fit the quadrant models on there with these as well. And so one of the biggest aspects, the most important aspects whenever you're doing a multi-stack, so remember we're gonna start with multi-stack, which is creating the multiple layered build first is you want everything to be on supports. And the reason why is that when we're printing this stack, we're going to put a full base plate on the bottom and we need to be able to remove it from that base plate. Same for that next layer of the scaffold or the next layer of the stack. We need to make sure that we are able to remove that, or remove the models and easily break them away from the structure. And so I'm going to start with adding in my supports. So I'm going to generate supports and we'll simply select apply. And the software will automatically apply the supports where necessary. Just about there. All right, perfect. So we went ahead and applied supports to our models. The next step that we're going to add is we're going to do a multi-stack. So I'm going to add my scaffold plate. And so there's a little icon. It looks like three little layers. We're going to go and select that. And then we're going to simply select apply. You do have the ability to add in different like shapes, for example. And so if you wanted to have a hexagon, just triangle or square shapes for the scaffold, you can. And you can also change how thick it is and how much space is between each one of the holes there for the shape itself. Beyond that, the next step is we're going to add in a scaffold column. So we're going to add columns in. And so let me go and look at this from an absolute bottom point of view. That's where you're going to want to look at. 
we actually want to add in enough scaffold columns to fill up this whole space. And so I'm going to add a scaffold column here, here, here. And I want each one of these circles that's being created to overlap as close as I can. A little tip that I have found is that the cone angle starts at 20 degrees. I've actually found that if I go to 15 degrees, I'm able to still achieve a proper stack and my circle is able to take up a little bit more space. And so I can actually get away with a little bit less columns or fewer columns to be able to create this. All right. Something else you want to be mindful of. I just accidentally put this on the model. I want to remove that first and then add one in and make sure that's not touching. There we go. So I went ahead and I created my scaffold plate. A common mistake that people will end up or users will end up making is that they'll go ahead and they'll import in another model. And so let's go ahead and import in one more model. And they'll manually try to apply it here in this actual section of the software. To apply another layer, we're actually going to create a new build. And so you do not want to essentially add in parts or add in a model, and then try to drag it and put it on top. The software technically would slice it, but it's not going to be the effective way in doing this. And so the software actually thinks that this is kind of just hanging in space. And so the effective way to do this, or the proper way, is that we would simply go ahead and create a new build. And so I'm going to create the next build, so the next layer that's going to sit on top of the scaffold plate. And so I'm going to make sure that I'm choosing the same printer. And so I did the Pro 4K 80 UV. I want to use the same material. So for example, the Vera Model OS Ivory and the same layer thickness to be able to accomplish this. So I'll select OK. And then from here, I'm going to select my files. I'm going to go ahead and just choose the same model, and then we'll just duplicate it a few times, uh, just for time's sake purposes. All right. All right, so let's say we had this as the next layer. I would simply go ahead and add my supports. Remember, crucial step, you have to add supports. So I'll hit and apply. It'll apply the supports. And we're going to do a total of three just so you can see that process. And it will move on to multi range. All right, so we went ahead and we have our model supported. We're gonna add in our scaffold again. So we'll go ahead and apply the scaffold. Let's go ahead and let's change this. Let's do a triangle one, for example. And so now we have the triangle scaffold. And then I'm gonna add in my columns. So I'm gonna come back to the software and I, under scaffold columns, I'm gonna select on add here. And now I'm just gonna start filling in the area. Almost there. Okay. 
So from here, let's go ahead and add in our final plate. So we'll do the top. Once again, it follows the same rhythm, rhythm, same printer, same material, same layer of thickness. And I'm gonna go ahead and choose, we'll choose this bridge model. And then let's go back and choose our other crown and bridge model, okay. All right, and let me go ahead and clone this all one more time. Okay, so the final step once again, when you're doing the multi-stack, please apply supports. If not, the models will be fused to that base layer, uh, that scaffold plate, and you would have to literally manually saw them all off. Um, and that's uh, extensive work. All right. Almost there. All right, very good. So the final step to actually get all three of these layers to attach to each other is to open up the build wizard. And so this is, this capability is all in the build wizard. And you have this little window here on the left-hand side that allows for multi-stacking. And so now if I check each one of these boxes, I have the ability to have all of these to all these builds to stack on top of each other. Another little tip, when we were going through and building these, the first job I had was a stack with the, or sorry, was a build with a scaffold. The second was a build with a scaffold. And the third was not a build with a scaffold. It was a build, but no scaffold. If you were to, for example, have these out of alignment, when you go to, uh, connect them, we can see that I have a red line as an air. And so we can see that these are not stacking properly. This build here, the third job is actually the one that has the scaffold. The second one does not. So what you want to do is make sure that these are in the correct order. And so now when you go to start the job, all three of them stack appropriately. So from here, we can see that the print time for this build is about seven hours and four minutes. Uh, once again, this is a job that I'd want to run at night. I wouldn't want to run it during the day. I would want to run it at night. And I mean, you could technically run it during the day. It's up to you. But it makes the most sense to run this at night when nobody's there. Uh, a lot of users will notice right out of the gate that this whole scaffold column and plate is made out of the same resin that you're printing the models. So your cost per model is gonna go up. However, that is gonna be significantly cheaper than employing somebody to stay there overnight at the laboratory and to print each one of these builds separately and post-process them throughout the night. You could simply have this job run overnight. Um, I don't have fast print motor separation detect turned on. When I do turn that on, it's gonna make this build be four hours and five minutes. And that is printing in 50 micron layers. That's phenomenal. Uh, we're gonna take this a step further after I explain the multi-range. We're gonna apply multi-range to this. If you look at my build, I have a combination of models here, of uh, fixed and removable prosthetic on the first layer. The second layer are splint models. We can print those in 100 micron layers. And then the final build is 50 micron layers. Let's see how we can increase that speed. And we'll show you that here in a moment. All right, before we continue on to multi-range, does anybody have any questions about multi-stack? All right, so looks like we had a question. Um, 
What do you do in post-process uh, of removal of the dimples created by the support? So those, those dimples itself, uh, I mean, they're on the bottom of the model. So they're in an area that really has no value. However, if those dimples do bother you, then I know some users will actually take like uh, 100 or 120 grit sandpaper and just simply do a quick scrub over with the bottom of the models and then those support nubs go away. Um, and just a little tip for removing the scaffold. So when this scaffold is completely printed, all of these will be combined in. And so a little tip is to use the actual, uh, the little object removal tool that came with your printer, that little uh, flat blade with the red handle actually works great for just pushing in and crushing all those supports in between and all the models will come off fairly well. For the layers in between that has a scaffold, you're going to want to, uh, you'll want to cut those off. Um, there'll be a little bit more time consuming, but once you cut those off, you can almost twist that scaffold plate off and break it away. And then you'll have access to that next layer of models. Um, we have another question. And it says, when we build two more than two layers, we have failure. The base, base is distorted. We think it's due to vibrations. Do you have a solution for this? And so this customer, this user is, once they build that second layer or build more than two, so if they build a third layer from what it sounds like, there's distortion to that third layer. And so first and foremost, the, the thing I would look at first is making sure that you have enough of these uh, scaffold columns. And so these columns are important. The first time that I tried playing with this software, and I actually, I, uh, it was me and Evan Kemper, application engineer here with Wimix, we went ahead and put together our first uh, scaffold build. And in that scaffold build, we actually just did the four corners in the center. And we're like, that's enough. And what will happen is in between layers, if there's not enough scaffold columns, the layers will sag and you will get distortion on the next layer. Um, another tip for this is make sure you have enough material in the tray as well. Because this is a longer build and a bigger build, you may be running out of material. And if you don't have enough material to pull back into the center of the build, you can have distortion and failure. And so another tip for printing with a multi-stack uh, build is to make sure you have enough resin in the resin back. Um, vibrations could be also the issue, but if your first couple layers are printing fine, then uh, I, would, I, I wouldn't think it would be vibration. Um, let's see here. Um, when I've tried to print a stack job, I find the column separate from the build plate and the models and stack come out distorted. Is there a way to, okay, so I believe that uh, may have helped answer that. Um, and if you guys are struggling with this, uh, please reach out to your support channel, Whitmix, and uh, contact your uh, SEGA support as well. And so remember, uh, your printers and software comes with lifetime technical support offered from Whitmix and Asiga. And so if you go to asiga.com, log into your account, you can open up a support uh, ticket. There you can go ahead and upload your build. And so uh, just a little tip, if you're having issues, there you go. You can actually export each one of these builds by going to file, export build, name it appropriately, maybe like layer one, layer two, layer three and simply go ahead and provide that to us uh, in a support ticket. We'll go ahead and analyze it, see if maybe there was an issue with the way it was set up. Uh, and then we can go ahead and give you some tips on how to improve this uh, stacking effect. All right, I think those were all the questions at this point in time. Let's go ahead and take a look at multi-range and then we're gonna jump back and combine the two together to create the ultimate print. And so I might go ahead and create a new build and I'm going to do it on a Max, for example. Uh, we have a Sega. We have a particular material file created for multi-range. It's not always necessary, depending on the material itself and the manufacturer. Um, if you're having issues with multi-range, please let us know via support ticket and let us know what material you're using. If you are using a Sega Denta model, we do have an INI file specific for multi-range, and we do recommend that you start with that. I'm going to go ahead and set this a Sega multi-range. I'm going to set it to 150 micron layers. And so I'm gonna create a build that is set to be for 150 microns. And let's go ahead and let's add in our parts. So I'm gonna add in, we're gonna do this dental model, uh, the crown and bridge model with the dies. And let's go ahead and let's clone it. All right. 
right, and let's go ahead and put it so we have these intertwining. Give me a few minutes while I play Tetris with the software. Uh, just to let you guys know, if you don't use this feature often, there's a rectangular select feature, which is really nice. It allows you to essentially left click and drag, create a box over the structures you want to move, and then you can left click and move it. Okay, we have almost all of our models in. We have our models in. Let's go and put our dies in. With printing with multi range, it's not necessary to print on supports. You can print directly to the base plate. And so, multi range lives strictly in the build wizard. And so to apply a multiple range or a dynamic range to the build, you'll simply have to do it inside of the build wizard. And so we're going to move through the next, we're going to move through the first page. I'm going to add on fast print mode and separation detect. And so right now the printer is stating that this is going to take 21 minutes to print. Phenomenal. However, if we're printing this in 150 micron layers and it's meant for a crown or bridge application, I'm not going to achieve the surface resolution that I need to be able to accurately create my restoration. And so I'm going to go ahead and add in a range. And so right here in the build wizard, under the advanced parameter section, there's an uh, ability to add ranges. Now, you do have to be careful and mindful of a couple areas, and I'll, I'll cover that now. So I'm going to add in a range. So the first range is your burn in. And so that burn in range, we want that to be. We're okay with that being 150 micron layers. And that uh, slice count is currently two. So we're gonna have two layers uh, for our burn-in layers itself, our burn-in burn -in structures. You never want this burn-in slice count to be zero. If you have this at zero accidentally when you're setting up your ranges, you won't actually receive the burn-in layer. So the burn-in layer is a longer exposed layer to make sure that the objects stick to the build plate. And if you do not apply that, or if you do, if that's set to zero, you will have a failed print. The next thing uh, that we want to look at is how far from the first layer up do I want 150 micron layers applied? And so we have to actually select on print range from, so it's going to start at 0.3 millimeters. That's after the burn-in range ends. And I'm going to put in a print range two. Let's do. Um, Let's do 12 millimeters, for example. So we can see right at 12 millimeters, uh, we don't want to do that because you can see that there's some margins that are maybe being cut off. So we're going to go a little bit lower. So let's do 10. All right. So for the 10 micron, or sorry, at, from 0.3 to 10 millimeters, I'm going to print that in still 150 micron layers. So the first 10 millimeters is printed at 150 micron layers. And then the final, so from 10 millimeters to the rest of the application, I'm going to put it at 0.05. Let's print that in the high resolution. Let's do that in 50 micron layers. So from here, I'm printing a 50 micron build in 34 minutes. So that's a projected time of what this will take, which is really quick. And the cool thing about it is, is that I'm able to achieve Lower, lower resolution in, de in areas that do not require that detail. And then I, at the areas that I need the detail at, so the occlusal surface or the dies itself, then I can go ahead and achieve the 50 micron layer resolution, which is acceptable for producing a fixed application. And so we'll go ahead and we'll send this to the printer. And so let's call this multi-range. We can actually view the slices. So we can view the first series of slices through it, a little bit thicker. And then once it gets to a certain point, then the slices will have reduced shift and changes because it's a finer. So we can see the image now is significantly more fluid as it's changing. 
If we're going to go to the web interface, so when you actually start this print job, you'll have a multi-range uh, test there. And if we go to print it, you would simply be able to go ahead and continue the build and start as normal. There was a predecessor version. So if you're on an earlier firmware or an earlier version of the software, it would actually export out like multiple builds. So keep that in mind. If you are not on the latest version, it may give you a question like, hey, do you want to link the two builds together? And you would. Uh, if you are on a latest version of the firmware and software, you don't have to worry about linking the multiple ranges together on starting from the print itself. So that's multi-range, really unique aspect. You can use this for different structures. So let's say if I wanted to print, well, let's do another build. Let's say I was printing a uh, surgical guide. So let me find my surgical guide. So helps if you click it when you go to open it. So let me go ahead and apply my supports. All right. So I have my surgical guide here, and I have it set to print in 100 micron layers. So I can tell the software to print the first so many millimeters to print in 100 micron layers. And let's say if I wanted the actual, uh, the actual drilling access hole, for the surgical guide to be in 50 micron layers. Let's say if I was concerned that maybe I wasn't getting as accurate of a hole as I uh, needed, then I could simply go ahead and create that range. And so the same process, I'm not gonna print this in fast print mode. And I'm gonna add in a range. So the first range for the, uh, let's, do, let's do multiple ranges. So we're gonna go ahead and do 150 micron layers. For the first, let's say five millimeters. And so if I click on that, I can see all of my supports are now in uh, our five millimeters. Then let's go ahead and print the next two millimeters, or sorry, the next, yeah, the next two millimeters. So from five to seven millimeters in 100 micron layers. So here, and then let's put print the final in 50 micron layers. So let's say if I was concerned about this final aspect to be a little bit more precise, then I could tell it to do it in 50 micron layers. And so instead of printing the whole surgical guide in 50 micron layers, I could do it in multiple ranges and save time. That time saved on this build can be used for the next build that you have in queue and should in turn create a higher output from your existing hardware. So on the final aspect, Let's go ahead and let's take a look at that multi-range and multi-stack together in one. So I'm going to actually do two different, uh, uh, let's see here. Let's just do the first two builds here. Actually, let's do all three. So we'll do all three builds. And we're going to get pretty creative with our multi-range with the multi-stack. So I'm going to print it in 50 micron layers. This is the Vera model OS Ivory from Whitmix and we're printing it in fast print mode. So right now it's projecting that this print should take about four hours and five minutes. So let's start adding in a few ranges. And so for the burn in, uh, for the first layers, let's go ahead and let's do, let's do a slice of two, actually let's do, uh, we're gonna do print range from zero to 0.3. And we're going to do 150 micron layers. So the first, we're going to do two burn-in layers, and it's 150 micron layers each. From there, from the burn-in range, let's go ahead and these are a combination of different models. So let's go ahead and let's apply this to be, let's say, the first 10 millimeters to be 0.150, 150 micron layers. So we can see here, we're not in any crucial areas yet. So we'll do 150 micron layers there. And now we can see the rest of our models itself. Let's keep this at 50 micron layers. 
for this dentition. However, we have some scaffold here. This scaffold doesn't need to be in 50 micron layers. So let's go ahead and tell that to start at, let's say, we'll stop this at layer 25. And at layer 25, or the, uh, sorry, the height of 25, we're gonna go ahead and apply this whole scaffold. And these models here, these are uh, for splints. Let's actually do those in 100 micron layers. So we'll do that at 0.1. And then we're on to the next scaffold. And I believe the rest of it was actually, let's take a look and see. Uh, we'll do that scaffold plate itself. We can tell this to do the next. Let's go to uh, 75. Okay, that may have been a little bit too much. So let's bring that down to 65, for example. We can tell this to be 150 micron layers. And then the final aspect where it really counts, we'll do that in 50 micron layers. So I just took this multi-stack build from four hours and five minutes down to two hours and 51 minutes with about three minutes of energy. Now, this is a little bit more extreme, so you do have to take your time on it. Uh, but what we told the software is that for the first burn-in layers, so from zero to 0.3, we're gonna do 150 micron layers. For the 0.3 to 10 millimeters high, we're gonna do 150 micron layers. Where it counted in this dentition for that first stack, we did 50 micron layers. So it's gonna be super fine detail. From 25 micron layers to, or sorry, from 25 millimeters to 53 millimeters. So that whole second build I did in 100 micron layers. And then from the, uh, that second build up for the scaffold to about 65 millimeters, I told you to do 150 micron layers. It don't need as much surface detail here. And then for the final aspect, I told you to do 50 micron layers. So this, this is kind of, this may be a little confusing, but once you play with it for a few times, then you'll really get a hang of it um, and really utilize that multi-range and multi-stack capability all in one if you absolutely want to. Uh, something that I would, uh, you know, definitely speak to Whitmix on is there is a user guide. And if you need it, you can also contact me. Uh, there is a user guide that explains the multi-range capability. We can provide that to you. And then on your uh, account portal, there is a training video that talks about the multi-stack. And so you can watch that video to highlight that a little bit further. That concludes everything I have for the hands-on demonstration. Uh, I think that was all the slides I had. Let me just jump back to it. So just to let everybody know, we do have three office locations across the world. And so with that, we get 24 hours support for all of our users. And so we have a SIGA America here in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Erfurt, Germany. We have a SIGA Europe. And then of course, our main headquarters is in Sydney. And if you guys need to get a hold of us in any way, shape, or form, please feel free to reach out to us. Our toll free number is 877 689 9998. And you can always email us at info at for more information. Bryce, that is everything. All right. Well, we do have some questions if you have a few more minutes. I sure do. Um, okay. So let's see, going through the chat here. Um, Stacy uh, asks When we build more than two layers, we have a failure. The bases distort. We think it's due to vibrations. Do you have any solution for this? Yeah, so that that one I did I did answer that one from Stacy and Seamus um, during the present, or I think from Seamus, I think I answered it as well. But really, the ultimate thing is make sure that you have the appropriate amount of columns for the scaffold layer, and then also make sure you have enough resin in the build. Um, if you don't have enough resin or if you don't have enough scaffolds, then you can cause like deterioration throughout that print for the scaffold. Um, also, another tip for the very first, first, first layer, make sure you're using the full base plate and not the shadow base plate as well. Uh, if you're having any, if I guess if you're struggling with it or having any issues, please open up a support ticket so we can take a look further and give you some tips on how to increase the success with that. Awesome. Uh, I've got one from Aaron. Uh, Aaron says, I'm new to printing. When printing dentures, is there a preset angle for nesting? or do I have to adjust proper angle myself? Also, what is the preferred nesting strategy for a SEGA? 
So the, the really the nesting strategy is going to come down to what is recommended from the material manufacturer that you're using. So every material manufacturer has a IFU, so instructions for use, for how you should be nesting the denture with that material with a particular printer. Uh, usually it's material characteristic and not printer char characteristic related. Uh, so for example, like the dense supply material, they have a particular angle that it has to be, uh, your denture base has to be supported in uh, versus for example, Dentka, they may have a different angle that you need to support it in. Uh, and so you definitely will wanna read the instructions for use for the material manufacturer to make sure that you have the proper angle or proper print, uh, I guess, location. The, um, and it, it doesn't automatically like preset jump into that particular angle. Uh, that's something that you would have to manually move, but it, it literally takes a, two seconds to rotate a structure as needed. But most importantly, make sure you read the IFU uh, for that material that you're going to use. Same for the denture teeth as well. In any biocompatible material, make sure you read the IFU because there may be some tips on post-processing and curing that you need to follow as well. Awesome. Um, Aaron also had another question. I can answer this one. Is the multi-range option available for all of Sega, uh, for a Sega Max UV or just a Pro 4K? It is both. Um, you can do that on, on both, both machines. Um, John asks, uh, do you always print in fast print mode? This is actually a, a really good question. Um, Corey, I'll let, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, absolutely. So the uh, it really comes down to the, the material that I'm using. So some materials may behave better with fast print mode than others. And so if it's a really thick material, let's say if it has a really high viscosity, uh, then you would want to, or sorry, really low viscosity, then you would want to go ahead and uh, maybe maybe printing in fast print mode may not be appropriate. Uh, so you'll have to go kind of a case by case scenario. I do print majority of my applications in fast print mode. Um, the, the only thing that I potentially have seen is that if, a, uh, if you're having like issues with a, a particular structure, or if you're having issues with your printer, maybe turn off fast print mode just to kind of take out a variable. But that's the only time that I really don't print with fast print mode. Uh, any new plans for a new Sega Max UV? So for any technical company, like a 3D printer manufacturer, really any tech company itself, we're always innovating and always looking for that next generation. Uh, but at this point in time, the Sega Max has been a phenomenal printer. And honestly, it, it's it's a hard machine to replace because one, it performs so well and it sells so well. But uh, we're always looking at the future. Awesome. Uh, does a higher, oh, I'm sorry, it uh, looks like we maybe skip one on accident from above. Um, is there a way to estimate how much material will be needed for a multi-stack build? So I believe it will do that for a multi-stack build. Let me see. Um, I think you'd have to do it layer by layer to, uh, hang on a second, let me try something real quick. Yes, it, it should actually apply it. So, um, uh, so actually it's, it's gonna be a little bit trickier for this because it's not gonna be all in this area. So after you send the build over, um, you have the ability to, actually you have the ability to export out build information. And so let me go ahead and just take a look at that. That should give the total consumption for the build. Yes, yeah, so this total build is gonna take roughly 258 milliliters. So it's gonna be a little bit greater than half uh, or a little bit greater than quarter of a bottle of resin. Uh, and so uh, it's actually closer to almost a third of a bottle of the resin itself. And so it, it does show it, it doesn't show it as if uh, like inside the software, we do have the build time estimator, which does give a material like cost calculator, but that will not consider all three scaffolds. And so, um, or the scaffold in general. So just keep that in mind that you'd have to kind of calculate it um, outside of the, the actual software. But yeah. Cool. Um, does a higher slice count at the burn-in range equal better adhesion to the plate? Not necessarily. So that that's all going to be, um, I mean, it, it depends on really the material characteristic. 
So you'll see different materials from different manufacturers. Some will have two layers for the burning layer. Some will have one, some will have three or four or five. And so it really comes down to the uh, chemical composition of the material and how it reacts when being cured. Uh, you can absolutely go ahead and, and attempt to put two burn-in layers, for example, if you like for your material, if you're having adhesion issues to see if that would potentially solve your uh, issues, but it, it may be stemming somewhere else like calibration, for example, and that's something that we'd want to look at first before altering uh, what the engineer spent so much time calculating. Awesome. Uh, how much can the build plate uh, how much can the container hold for the build? I think that's the resin tray that is what they're referring to. How much resin can the resin tray hold? So the, the resin vat for the Pro 4K is going to hold about one kilogram total. Um, you can actually apply just a little bit more than that. And then the max, it's about uh, 300 milliliters in the resin vat at one time. If you are doing a stack, that brings up a good point. And I, I meant to mention it earlier, um, is that you would want to go ahead and uh, you want to make sure that you have enough resin in that build before you leave for the day. And so if you are doing a multi-stack, it may be good or maybe beneficial for you to start that build uh, maybe an hour before you're leaving so that you can add a little bit more resin before you go home. There's, there's nothing more frustrating than starting a build and then forgetting to add resin in. <laughs> and so the, uh, that's a, a good point. Done that before. Yeah, I've done it a couple times too. I mean, I still do it today. <laughs> as much as I play with printers, you know, all day long, I still will accidentally start a build uh, and not put enough resin or not even latch down the, the resin tray. It happens. We're human. We make mistakes. Yeah. Um, okay. We have one more, if that's okay. Uh, first build uh, does not touch base plate many times, even in yellow. I have a hard time moving it to all yellow on the basis of the, <coughs> the base itself. I think maybe, I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to, but I wonder if it's, um, uh, could you demonstrate the, uh, the eight facet downwards? Yeah, 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 yep, yep. No, I think that's exactly what it is, right? What it is, Bryce. Um, probably help if I share my screen again too, huh? All right. So I believe what you are looking for, uh, let me just import in just a random model. So for example, this model here is nice and bright yellow. And I believe that's what your concern is, is that maybe your model comes in maybe slightly angled. You're not getting that yellowed look on the base. And so there's a tool called Rotate Facet Downwards. And so uh, you can actually activate it by finding it under Tools. Uh, you can uh, actually, if you go over to your options, you may not have, or view, you may not have all of your uh, viewing enabled, but there is a tab under the Transform panel that has that same option, Rotate Facet Downwards. And so if I click on that, and if I click on the surface, I want to rotate down facing the build plate. It will automatically make it parallel. And then another cool trick is you have this uh, translate to platform origin, origin, and you can tell it for X and Y to not move it, but Z, bring it to the minimum. And so now I can get that shading that I'm looking for. It may not be exactly perfect like it was before, but this is actually touching that first layer. If you are concerned, you can go ahead and do it again, maybe at a different point. There you go. And that's the rotate facet downward option. Awesome. Uh, and I think, well, it looks like we actually have one on Facebook too. Um, and I'll, I'll take this one. Um, David asks, how many layers can one achieve with one uh, bottle of resin? It, it totally depends because, you know, you could have one object on, you know, your build plate, or you can have seven objects on your build plate. So those layers, you know, every layer is, does not require the same amount of resin. So there's really no way to calculate that. Yeah. Um, the correct answer is all of the layers, Bryce. You can, you can print all of the layers with the bottle of, uh, yeah. <laughs> until, you, until you run out. That's right. Um, okay, cool. Well, I think, let me just double check here. I think that is, double check the chat. Yeah, okay. I think that is everything and we are actually over time. So um, a couple things. 
um, before we wrap, uh, first of all, there's going to be a little uh, like poll pop up on your screen, like a little survey. If you are interested in the Asiga Max and you would like um, a sales rep to contact you about it, you can select yes, and then um, that will send your contact information that you registered with to um, to your appropriate to the appropriate uh, sales representative. Um, but you know, if you're not if you already have one or you know you're not interested in, in talking to a sales rep, feel feel free to to select no. Um, also, again, um, just to re reiterate, this was recorded, so feel free to, to check it out on our website, witmix.com, or on Facebook, or on YouTube, um, and keep an eye out uh, within one to two days for that CE credit email. Uh, and with that, a uh, huge thank you to Corey. Uh, this is super informative, and it's always, you know, it's always a pleasure getting to talk to you now that we don't necessarily work side by side anymore. So um, thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you to everybody that attended this morning. Absolutely. Thank you, Bryce. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We'll see you. See you guys.